So thank you for that kind introduction and welcome to today's webinar where we're going to talk about how to build bigger, better panels with new Starbright dies from Biorad. And if we take a quick look at today's agenda, I'm going to briefly talk about flow cytometry as an important tool for discovery. Uh, I'm going to go over panel building, panel building rules, and some of the common problems that people have when building multicolor panels. And then I'm going to do Starbright dies as a panel building solution. I'm going to show some data in conventional and full spectrum flow cytometry. And then we're going to show some data from some of our customers who have used Starbright dies. So as you know, flow cytometry measures the properties of cells as they pass through a beam of light. Uh, and we can just see here in the uh, little infographic, we have the lasers that are focused via a lens onto the stream of cells in that cells are in a single cell suspension. And uh, they will have antibodies attached to them or conjugated to fluorescent dyes. And the light that is emitted can then be detected and split into each different wavelength that emits from different fluorescent dyes. And this can be detected then uh, on a PNT or APD. And this uh, converts the photons of light into an electronic signal, which can then be displayed uh, on your computer. And you can use antibodies and fluorescent dyes to detect lots of different markers on cells and within cells. And here's just some examples of some common flow cytometry assays. So immunophenotyping being one of the most common. But it varies to things like apoptosis, proliferation, cell cycle, even just looking at viability of cells, looking at gene expression, particularly with fluorescent proteins. And finally, you can also do cell sorting as well. Flow cytometry is very popular. We can see here on the graph that the number of publications per year is rising and it continues to rise. So why are people doing flow cytometry? Why do they choose flow cytometry? Well, there's, a, there's quite a few reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons is it's very fast. You can do thousands, if not tens of thousands of cells per second. So this means you can actually analyze a large number of cells very quickly. Samples require very little processing. You just have to harvest them, uh, maybe from a tissue, or you could be collecting a sample such as blood or uh, even just tissue culture cells. And you can just run them as soon as you've made a single cell suspension allows you to run mixed cell populations and you get actual numbers you get percentages you get the number of cells in each uh, positive group you can detect many many parameters per cell and you can combine some of those assays that i mentioned in the previous slide so you can look at immunophenotyping but also apoptosis or proliferation or cell death within those populations and this allows you to get a lot more information from precious samples this is therefore saving you time, saving money, and it can even reduce the frequency that you have to do for sampling, especially with uh, some of those rare pa uh, patient samples. So why do you want to do panel building in flow cytometry? And I think the easiest place to look at this would be for immunophenotyping. So immunophenotyping is where you identify specific cell types based on markers, and each of those markers is attached to a different fluorescent dye. So using T cells, an example, in peripheral blood, you may need four to six colors to see the different T cells you want to see. So CD3 to identify T cells, then CD4 and 8 to identify T helper and, and cytotoxic T cells, and maybe something like CD25 and CD127 to identify T Rex. You may want to look at this a bit closer, and therefore they get increased complexity if you wanted to look at something like memory status, you need more markers and activation status, cytokine profiles to see uh, how active the cells are, or even to detect different cell subtypes, such as IL-17, to detect Th17 cells. And then you may want to look at more than just the T cells. So B cells, myeloid cells, even malignant cells. But you may wish to look at the memory activation and cytokine profiles within those cells as well. So you can see how this can build up very, very quickly. So panel building can be broken down into six rules that will help you build better panels. So I would start with 
understanding the configuration of your instrument. Know how many lasers you have and what the wavelength of them is. And know how many filters and what the specification of the filters are. This will tell you which fluorophores you can detect and how many fluorophores you can detect. Speaking of fluorophores, know your fluorophore properties. What's the excitation and emission? How much spillover do they have into other channels? Know your relative brightness. They're not all the same. And with knowing that spillover, try and avoid overlap where possible. And you can do this by spreading out your fluorophores across your lasers and filters. And this will help avoid compensation and therefore avoid spreading. It's a good idea to rank the antigen density of all your markers. Put a bright fluorophore on a low abundance marker and conversely a dim fluorophore on a high abundance marker. And this will just ensure you get better detection of those low abundance markers. And the dim fluorophore on the high abundance marker will just help reduce some of that spillover. Know your marker expression patterns. If you have two fluorophores that are very similar, put them on mutually exclusive markers. So CD3 for T cells, CD19 for B cells. That way you know if you've got your compensation correct. You can use the parent descendant rule where this is your the descendant should always express the parent marker. So a CD8 T cell will always express CD3. And if you have spillover, it doesn't matter because you know that those cells should always be expressing both markers. And I would say put a, on a rare cell, put uh, the, a bright fluorophore on a, on a cell you know is going to be rare. Always do antibody titration. And in fact, I would always titrate any fluorescent marker that you're going to use in flow cytometry. This will help optimize your stain index by giving you the best separation between the positive and negative. And generally, this does this by reducing the background. And there's an optional uh, rule here is, is in, including a dump channel. Uh, this is just where you put several markers that could be on several different cell types, all on the same fluorophore. And then you can just exclude those cells from your analysis. A good example is if, if you want to exclude myeloid cells because they may be sticky or have a lot of autofluorescence, you can just put all your myeloid markers on one channel and get rid. Now, if you're not particularly familiar with panel building, we do have two uh, services that can help. We have a panel building service from our tech support. And if you just go to this website, uh, Flow Panel Building Services, you can submit in a simple form your proposed panel and they will help you build that with the right fluorophores. And we also have a flow panel builder as well, which is an easy to use uh, tool where you just simply select your instrument, pick your markers, find your fluorophore and choose your antibody. And then this will uh, help you. So you can go to our website at Flow Panel Builder and have a go for yourself. I mean, there are some common problems with panel building, and I've just laid some of them out here. Some cells are hard to detect because not all dyes are bright, and the solution, have a bright dye. However, when you add more and more dyes together, they all do influence each other, and so you can get increased compensation and spreading leading to reduced resolution. Um, if you have dyes that have a lot of spillover and cross laser excitation into neighboring channels. And the solution to that is to have dyes with narrow excitation and emission, especially useful when multiplexing. So another problem is having to change your workflow or your experiment to incorporate an, an additional dye. Some dyes require special buffer or special staining conditions uh, to prevent interactions. And so the solution to that is you need a special buffer. So you need to have an antibody that doesn't need a special buffer it can, or it can work in a special buffer. So it can fit into new and existing workflows. Some challenges also are based on fixation and photosensitivity. Uh, tandem dyes especially suffer from lot to lot variability. They don't like to be fixed and they can break apart uh, when exposed to light, leading to different results. So the solution to this is to have a consistent dye that generates 
reproducible data allows you effective comparison uh, from experiment to experiment. And another issue that people have is they don't want to have to do extra work to ensure all the fluorophores in their panel are compatible with each other. So you want to be able to have dyes that are multiplexing compatible both with themselves and with other dyes. So now I'd just like to start telling you about the new Starbright dyes from Biorad. And I'll start with the Starbright Violet. Violet meaning excited by the 405 laser. And we have nine dyes ranging from emitting at 440 nanometers all the way to 790. And you can see the dyes which these are competitor dyes to. Now these Starbright Violet dyes are brighter than these existing dyes. And you can just see here, I've shown the stain index of all the Starbright dyes in purple compared to Brilliant Violet and Super Bright in red and green respectively. And you can see that they are generally brighter, especially at the longer stoke shift. We also have a range of Starbright ultraviolet dyes excited by the 355 nanometer laser. And these are competitor dyes for the brilliant ultraviolet range. And we have eight of these ranging from Starbright ultraviolet 400 emitting at 400 nanometers all the way to Starbright ultraviolet 795 emitting at 795 nanometers. Again, I've laid out the stain index of the Starbright dyes compared to brilliant ultraviolet dyes. And you can see that the star bright ultraviolet dyes are again generally brighter than the competitor dyes. And finally, we have the star bright blue dyes. Now, at the moment, we only launched one star bright blue 700, and this is a competitor dye for Percy B. 5.5 and Brilliant Blue 700. And again, this is a, a very bright dye, it's as bright as Brilliant Blue 700, brighter than Percy B. 5.5. And we do intend to launch another five Starbright Blues this year. In addition to the superior brightness of Starbright dyes, we also have designed them to have narrower excitation and emission profiles. And I've got an example of one of each from each of the laser lines. So if we look at Starbright Ultraviolet, we can see that as Starbright Ultraviolet dyes are not traditional tandems, you do not get uh, a signal from the donor molecule. And we also have reduced excitation at 640 nanometers, unlike that seen in BUV661. In Starbright Violet, we can see Starbright Violet 515, first off, has a much narrower emission profile than BV510. Therefore, it has less spillover into neighboring channels. And it also has reduced excitation by the 355 laser. And Starbright Blue 700, again, uh, has reduced excitation by the 640 laser. So Starbright dyes that generally give you better population separation, reduce spillover, and reduce spreading. Starbright dyes also give you very reproducible data. They don't require a special buffer, but will work in special buffers if needed. And you can just see here on the left that we've tested Starbright dyes in PBSBSA, in our own staining buffer, and in the Brilliant Stain Buffer, and we get very, very similar results. We've tested various buffers that include sodium azide or EDTA, or even without a carrier, and we still get very, very reproducible staining. We get re reproducible staining within the lots. So you can see here on mouse peripheral blood, we stained CD3. Uh, in green, we added the original sample. And then we then stored that vial in the fridge for 15 months and compared it to a vial that had not never been opened and on a different sample. And you can see how similar those stainings are within lot. But we also have lot to lot reproducibility as well. And you can see here two different lots in red and blue. Uh, this is human CD8 on human uh, peripheral blood. And you can see how similar uh, the staining is from lot to lot as well. 
Starbright diodes are also very stable. And I'm just showing here on the left the accelerated stability data, where we can see in the pinky red color, Starbright Blue 700 over a period of 51 months does not reduce its staining at all. And this is compared to Percy Psi 5.5, which is dimmer and over time reduces its staining index. We also have some real-time data now uh, to show that they are stable for up to three years when stored at four degrees. We also have some real-time data where we stored antibody in a master mix on the bench. And so we, we made up a master mix and left it on the bench in the dark uh, for up to two weeks and compared it to a freshly made up sample. And this is uh, human CD14 on peripheral blood. And you can see there's no change in the staining. And then if we left the same master mixes out in the light, after four days there was no reduction, but it took up to you know, 14 days to see a reduction in the signal. So what we can say from that is that the Starbright dyes have a high stability. It's, more, it's a stability equivalent to more than four years at four degrees. They are not temperature sensitive, and they are not particularly photosensitive either. Another great benefit of the Starbright dyes is their ability to be fixed. And I've just got a few examples here where we fixed in paraformaldehyde, 2% paraformaldehyde. Uh, we've also then compared the fixing in 2% paraformaldehyde with uh, a methanol solution. And again, there's no reduction in the stain index. And we've also compared it to an ethanol fixation method as well. And this is one of our new Starbright Blues. And you can see that ethanol fix compared to fresh still gives you really, really good separation and there's no reduction uh, when, when, when fixing with ethanol. Starbright dyes can even be pre-mixed prior to you be, being used. So we made up an antibody cocktail of 11 Starbright dyes and left them in the fridge for up to 33 days and then compared the staining profile to a freshly made up antibody cocktail, both of them in PBSBSA. Uh, and then we just stained the same sample of human peripheral blood for one hour at room temperature and looked at the different profiles. And you can see here that day zero gives you a virtually identical profile to the antibody cocktail stored for up to 33 days. Now this gives you great flexibility because it means you can make up a large master mix and then store it in the fridge and stain samples as they come in over time and know you're going to get reproducible staining. And this can even reduce some of the error that you can uh, get from making up master mixes. So I think it's time to look at some data and we're going to start by looking at a direct comparison of the star bright violet dyes to brilliant violets and super brights in a 12 color panel where there are six star bright dyes or violet excitable dye equivalents in each panel and then some other common fluorophores such as FITSI, PE and Alexa dyes. And it's a simple panel that allows you to identify T cells myeloid cells, B cells, and then look at some of the memory phenotypes within those populations. So here are all three of those panels. And I'm gonna go into detail in the next slide, but really all I want to say on this slide is that all three panels worked and you could identify all the different populations that you would expect to see. However, if you look at them in a little bit more detail, you can see some differences with the Starbright dyes. So, for example, here, looking at CD19, Starbright Violet 670 gives you better separation than Brilliant Violet 650 and Superbright 645. Starbright Violet 440 is maybe not quite as bright in this panel as BV421, but is brighter than uh, Superbright 436. BV7, Starbright Violet 710 is brighter than BV711, which is 
brighter than super bright 702. Star bright violet 610 gives you similar separation to both the brilliant violet and the super bright. And star bright violet 790 gives you better separation than BV785, which is better than super bright 780. And star bright violet 515 is much brighter than BV510. And unfortunately, there's no super bright equivalent here to do a direct comparison. So you're getting better separation of these populations with the star bright dyes. Now, as we have talked about, uh, brightness can be an issue if you're getting spillover into other channels. And although I'm not going to show the spillover and spreading of all three panels, what I can say is, in fact, the spillover and spreading was reduced for the star bright dye panel, even though they were star bright dyes were brighter. So you, we have brighter dyes with better spectral characteristics. So we've shown you some relatively small panels so far, nothing above 12 colors. So to demonstrate the versatility of the star bright dyes, we designed a relatively large panel, a 23 color panel on the Z5 cell analyzer. And this contains star bright ultraviolets, star bright violets, three star bright blues, and two star bright yellows that are in development. And so it actually has 16 star bright dyes in this panel. Uh, and this panel allows you to identify T cells, B cells, NK cells, granulocyte populations, monocytes, and various memory and effective memory populations as well. And one of the great things about this panel is that it was done using PBS, BSA, as the staining buffer, because star bright dyes, when you multiplex them, do not require a special buffer. Now, so far, we've only shown you data from conventional flow cytometry, and as full spectrum flow cytometry is becoming ever more popular, I thought we'd spend the next few slides looking at some data of the star bright dyes in full spectrum flow cytometry. But first, let's just have a quick recap, and in very simple terms, I'll explain the difference between the two. So in conventional flow cytometry, you have one specific detector to collect the photons in the region exhibiting maximal emission. And you can see here, highlighted by the asterisk, star bright violet 515. Uh, in this case, it's a 52550 bandpass filter where you collect the light. Now, in full spectrum flow cytometry, you have an array of detectors collecting the spectral signature of the dye at different wavelengths. And all these detectors are used at the same time. So you can see you will get not just the signal from the violet laser, uh, but the ultraviolet and, in this case, the blue and red uh, lasers as well. And you can see, actually, so star bright violet is also used as an example for the full spectrum, showing how different it is compared to conventional. So you can take the spectral ribbon and compare it to other dyes. And that's what we did. And we found that the star bright dyes had significant differences to other dyes. And I've got an example here. So we have star bright violet 610 and we have brilliant violet 605. And they actually have very different full spectral profiles. Now, in conventional flow cytometry, you would use a filter uh, just shown uh, at the top. And they actually have similar maximal excitation and emission, and you cannot use these two dyes together. However, in spectral flow cytometry, because they are significantly different, you can. And this is shown here. So we had a simple four color panel. CD19 on Alexa for 488, CD3 on star bright blue 700, and then CD8 on star bright violet 610 with CD4 on BV605. And you can see, you can separate out the CD8 and the CD4 population quite happily. So we didn't stop there. We looked to see if there's any more novel combinations you can multiplex. And the first one I'm showing is BV421, Star bright violet 440 and Pacific blue. And they can all be put together uh, with CD3, 4 and 8 in this case. And then the CD4 population, you can see the CD127, CD25, Treg population. There are other novel combinations. And on the ultraviolet laser, 
we have two that I'm going to show now. Um, Starbright Ultraviolet 510 with BUV 496. Starbright Ultraviolet 665 with BUV 661. Where we have also novel combinations of the violet laser excitable dyes. And here we can see Starbright Violet 515 with BV 510. And Starbright Violet 710 with BV 711. And even the Starbright Blue 700 can be used with Percipi Sci 5.5. Now some of these similarities are quite high and therefore the spreading is quite high. Um, but it does give you extra options when you want to increase your panel size. And if you go to uh, our website, you can find some more examples of novel combinations and we also show the similarity index as well. Now this section on full spectrum flow cytometry wouldn't be complete without a large panel containing star bright dyes. And so an example here I'm showing you is a 31 color panel on a four laser spectral instrument. And this panel contains 18 star bright dyes. And first thing to say is you can identify all the different populations you'd expect to see. T cells, B cells, NK cells, NKT, granulocyte populations, different monocyte populations. Nothing unusual in the staining. But what we have included in this panel are some of those unusual combinations I just mentioned. So we have the BV421 with Pacific Blue and Starbright Violet 440. We have Starbright Violet 515 with Brilliant Violet 510. And we also have Starbright Violet 610 with BV605. Now this panel actually contains several of our new Starbright Blues. But one of the things to point out here is that because we had multiple brilliant violets and we also had a brilliant ultraviolet we had to do the staining for this panel in brilliant buffer and the star bright dyes work just as well in brilliant buffer as they did in the one percent bsa used in the uh, other panel so what's available to purchase at the moment well we have star bright dyes on 22 human targets 12 mice target and streptavidin. Now these are common immunophenotyping targets, currently cell surface only. We don't have any intracellular targets yet. However, if you wish to do intracellular staining and you stain with Starbright dyes first before you use a fixed perm buffer, the Starbright dyes will work fine. They don't have any reduced performance when you uh, use fixed perm buffers. So if we do a quick recap, uh, star bright dyes are brighter than competitor dyes, uh, both polymer dyes and conventional fluorophores, and this allows you to see rare and low antigen density populations, but also just to get better separation of any population. They have narrow excitation emission, so this gives you less spillover and spread. They're compatible on any instrument, so in the Z5 and S3E from Biorad, and competitor cytometers as well as long as it has the right laser and filters. But it's also suitable for both conventional and spectral flow, and we've tested this in both. And we've even seen that Starbright dyes have uh, unique spectral profiles. Starbright dyes work in all buffers. There's no drop in performance with any common staining buffer so far, yet do not need a special buffer, unlike some other polymer dyes. You get very, very consistent staining. They're stable. There's no lot-to-lot -lot variability and minimal within-lot variability. You can fix them in both PFA and alcohol fixation uh, methods. And they're suitable for pre-mixing. They are suitable to be used in large multiplex panels. And this just in increases the flexibility uh, in your building panels and enhances what you can get from Biorad and allows you to increase the size of spectral panels because of those unique uh, spectral profiles. And finally, they're on common immunophenotyping targets. These are known clones. These are highly cited and validated in flow cytometry. So now I'd like to quickly talk to you about some of our new dyes that we'll be releasing this year. And that is the Starbright Blue series. I've actually shown you some data from the Starbright Blues. Uh, particularly in the spectral panel. 
And we've launched one, but we're actually going to launch another five. So we'll have a range from Starbright Blue 580 all the way up to Starbright Blue 810. And this expands the number of colors you can use off the 488 laser. Like the other Starbright dyes, these are bright, stable, work in any buffer. We've tested them in spectral flow cytometry, and they have unique spectra. And they're compatible with other 488 excitable dyes and PE tandem dyes when you use the 561 laser to excite the PE tandems. And we've incorporated three of those new Starbright Blues into this 11 color panel, again on human peripheral blood, where we can easily identify uh, CD3 T cells on Starbright Blue 810 and CD19 Starbright Blue 580. And then the CD8 population is using Starbright Blue 675. In addition to releasing the Starbright Blues this year, we're also going to be releasing the Starbright Yellow series. And there's going to be five Starbright Yellow dyes ranging from uh, PE equivalent, uh, Starbright Yellow 575, all the way out to a PE size 7 equivalent, uh, Starbright Yellow 800. And these are going to be bright with unique spectra, work in any buffer, be able to be fixed in alcohol-based buffers. But one of the really exciting things is they have reduced excitation from the 488 laser compared to PE and PE tandems. And this is just highlighted here in the bottom left, where we compare the spillover values in each of the Z5 channels uh, of PE and Starbright Yellow 575 uh, in red. And you can see, uh, highlighted in the green circle, this is one of the uh, this excitation from the 488 laser that the Starbright Yellow has a, a, about a third of the signal, maybe less than PE in that channel. And I'll just show you here the result of the fixation in methanol. So firstly, on the right hand side, we can see that compared to PE, Starbright Yellow 575 uh, can be fixed in a methanol-based fixation with minimal drop in performance, whereas if you fix PE in a methanol-based fixative, you get a significant drop in performance. But not only is the stain index maintained on Starbright Yellows, the spectral profile is maintained. Now, we can see in this spillover uh, uh, profile, again, in each of the channels of the Z5, that in yellow, we have the profile of PE uh, that has not been fixed. And then in red, the profile of PE when it is fixed. And you can see it's different to the profile of the uh, yellow uh, bars. Whereas if you compare the profile of Starbright yellow that is not fixed with Starbright yellow that is fixed in methanol in the blue and green bars respectively, they are the same regardless of the fixation or not. And I just have a quick 11 color panel where we've incorporated four of the Starbright yellow dyes with Starbright ultraviolets and Starbright violets. Uh, in a simple 11 color panel, they'll allow us to identify T cells and B cells um, and myeloid cells in human peripheral blood. And you get really good separation uh, from all the different populations. Now, so far, this has all been data that we've generated in-house, but I'd like to show you now some data generated by two customers, Dr. Pedroza from Oxford University and Dr. Burton from the Babram Institute in Cambridge. So firstly, Dr. Pedroza is looking at the immune environment in HIV-infected individuals with broadly neutralizing antibodies and with an aim to informing vaccine design. As she has longitudinal studies to identify uh, immune responsive features that could predict uh, the maturation of these neutralizing antibodies. And she has uh, three 31 to 34 uh, spectral panels uh, to do high dimensional phenotypic profiling of different subsets such as uh, follicular uh, helper T cells, NK cells, B cells and myeloid populations. So Dr. Petroza has three questions or aims that she wants to uh, see if Starbright dyes can help with. So firstly, 
CD19 is down-regulated HIV patients, so she needs a brighter dye to try and improve the stain index. She wants to know whether these new dyes can tolerate her staining protocol, which is a 37 degrees for 15 minutes, including the use of an intranuclear staining buffer, which contains methanol. And she wants to see if she can actually increase the panel size uh, because of the new spectral signatures of Starbright dyes. So firstly, Starbright Violet 515 is brighter than BB510, so she's able to get a better stain index and identify those CD19 positive cells easier. And they tolerate the methanol fixation better. So as you can see here on a titration that on the right hand side, Starbright Violet 515 is much brighter than BV510. And she was able to incorporate the two Starbright dyes into the panel to enable her to get a 35 color panel with better separation, as you can see highlighted by the red square looking at the B cells based on CD19 expression. And Dr. Burton's work uh, is looking at um, regulatory T cells that patrol the tissues. And T regs are critical in preventing autoimmune attack and maintaining homeostasis. So he's looking at do different tissue T regs have unique functions and adaptations. And to do this, he's using high parameter flow cytometry, measuring the T reg phenotypes in 50 different anatomical locations, and looking to see if they retain their tissue type when adoptively transferred into RAG knockout mice. So there were a couple of questions or aims uh, with these, these panels was, can the current panel be redesigned to improve detection of a specific marker, NER77, and determine the upregulation without compromising the T-reg detection? And can the additional myeloid cells that are found in RAG knockout mice still be effectively excluded? So the first panel had CD25 conjugated to PE psi 5.5. And NER77 is on PE because they need a bright marker, bright fluorophore for that marker. But unfortunately, the breakdown of PESI 5.5, it was affecting the detection of NER77. So the full stain looked very, very similar to the FMO. And so they couldn't be confident in what cells were expressing NER77. So the first step was if we replace CD25 with a star bright violet. 515, can you still detect the, the T regs? And this just shows that compared to the old panel, uh, the new panel using Starbright Violet 515 does not compromise on brightness and you can still detect the cells. When you look at a few more of the markers in that panel, you can see that using F480 and B220 and NK1.1, other cells could be effectively excluded um, from the T cells which is detected using Starbright Violet 440. And then you could detect the CD4 and CD8. And then you can see here, the, this is how they detected the Tregs based on CD25 and FOXP3. And if you then look at those CD25 positive cells, what's the expression of NER77? So now you can see that compared to the FMO control, which is extremely clean, you can see a, a, a definite positive population that are present, in this case in the liver, that are NER77 positive. And you can now look at the uh, upregulation uh, in different sites. So if we go back to those common problems that I started with that you can be found in panel building, where the challenges in panel building where you need a bright dye, star bright dyes are bright where you need narrow excitation to avoid compensation and spreading, Starbright dyes have that narrow excitation emission. Uh, Starbright dyes will work in any buffer, so you don't have to amend any existing workflows, and they easily fit into new workflows. You want to have consistent re reproducible data to allow effective comparison over time, and Starbright dyes do that. And finally, you want to make sure that you can have confidence that there are no unwanted interactions occurring in your panel and they're multiplexing compatible and Starbright dyes, as I've shown today, work in multicolor panels. 
So we do have a lot of support and resources to help you both with Starbright dyes and flow cytometry in general. For Starbright dyes, there are dedicated web pages where we show the spectra, example data, including panels, and this is in conventional and full spectrum flow cytometry. And we do have our online tools such as a spectra viewer and a panel builder which contain the Starbright dyes. And there's tech support that can help with panel building as well. Uh, we have literature such as a, we have a brochure, we have a fluorophor poster, and um, we also have uh, charts showing you the stain index. And then for general flow, we have things like a flow guide, flow workbook, you know, bro brochures on things like controls and cell frequency, antigen density, things that are going to help you build uh, better panels. So if you'd like to find out more, about Starbright dyes, you can go to our website at bioradantibodies.com forward slash Starbright. You can sign up, up to our regular communications via email. And you can sign up to find out specifically about Starbright dyes at bioradantibodies.com forward slash star. And that brings us to the end of the webinar today. I'd like to say thank you for listening. And it's time now to answer some of the questions you have. Thank you, Mike, for such an informative webinar. We've now come to the Q&A part. If you'd like to send us a question and haven't already submitted it, please use the Q&A widget. We'll follow up on all unanswered questions after the webinar. So our first question is, are all the star brights really bright? Are there any that you could recommend for a highly expressed antigen, like CD45, why I wouldn't want it to be too bright? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, because as we know, um, brightness can be a double-edged sword. Uh, and if you have spillover into neighboring channels with a bright dye, you'll get a lot more spillover. The spillover will be brighter. Um, so although we say our star bright dyes are bright, we, we, they are bright, and they are brighter than competitors, but they're not all as bright as PE or, or you know, BV421, for example. So some of the ultraviolet dyes, such as uh, the UV510 and the UV445, are actually not as bright. Um, and I'll be releasing some stain index comparisons soon on our website. So that will give people uh, more of an idea of uh, how, how the relative brightness of these dyes are. Thank you. The next question is, are star bright dyes similar to quantum dots? And the other half of it is, are Starbright dyes sensitive to heavy metal contamination if present in the stain buffer? So no, uh, Starbright dyes are not similar to quantum dots. They don't have a heavy metal core. Um, so the quantum dots, as I understand, they have a cadmium core. Um, so Starbright dyes are polymer dots uh, and don't contain any heavy metals at all. So no is the short answer. These dyes look very promising. Certainly, they seem to be equivalent or brighter than competitors. Could we get any more data on cross-laser excitation? It is usually what makes or breaks our panels on a conventional flow cytometer. Certainly, the Cytec Aurora data infers this could be an issue, and I'd be interested in a comparison with the competitor dyes. Yeah, so I did show um, some comparison just now uh, with the uh, star bright violet dyes against uh, brilliant violet and super bright. And whilst there is some cross laser excitation um, and some signal in other channels, it is generally less than uh, competitor dyes. Um, so whilst I didn't show today, uh, I have got the spillover matrix and the spreading matrix for the uh, star bright violet comparison. And again, this will be uh, available on our website very soon. Uh, and we're actually doing a star bright ultraviolet comparison with brilliant, violet, brilliant ultraviolets as well. And so I think that is a 12 or a 14 color panel where again, we'll be able to show all the spillover and the spreading as well. Um, but in the panel I showed, even though the, the star bright violet dyes were brighter, the spillover and the spreading was reduced compared to the competitor dyes. 
Thanks, Mike. Well, that uh, the, the next question. question. The next question uh, is, I'm interested in the UV dyes, and I'm wondering, in a conventional flow cytometer, would Starbright Ultraviolet 400 or Starbright Ultraviolet 445 be preferable? Could they, in fact, be used together, or would 400 spill over into 445 too much? Well, that would all really depend on what filters you have on your cytometer. Um, so if you have two separate filters, you can actually use uh, these two dyes together. Um, but not all cytometers have the correct filter setup, so you'd have to check. In fact, uh, if you use our panel builder, uh, that's a good way to, to check whether the filters on your instrument are compatible. Uh, on the Z5, you can use um, Starbright Ultraviolet 400 and Starbright Ultraviolet 445 together. Now, one of the nice things about Starbright Ultraviolet 445 is it is unique, and there is no um, competitor brilliant ultraviolet dye there. So the nearest dye, I think it's something like the Dye Light 350 or Alexa 350, and it's about 20 times brighter. So it's, it's a very useful dye. Um, I don't think the spillover between them is too bad, actually, as well. Um, but that data actually is on our website, on one of our posters. We have posters that were presented at CITO both last year and this year. And they do show the full spillover and spreading uh, of those dyes on those posters. Great. Do Starbright dyes work on compensation beads? Yes, they do. So this is something that we have done uh, for several different types of beads. Um, and I'm presuming the question here is linked to the fact that uh, if you're doing compensation for markers that are not highly expressed, you want to sometimes use beads in, in place of your cells. And not all dyes seem to work very well on beads. So we've tested the Starbright dyes on Ultra Comp beads, Ultra Comp Plus, ABC beads, and immunoglobulin binding beads. And we're just uh, testing them on um, some other beads, some slingshot beads now. Uh, and we're, we're waiting to see uh, what the final results of that is. But with all the other beads, we did a comparison of a 12 color panel and we compared compensating using the beads or with cells. And we saw no difference between any of the panels, actually. So it was very, very good. So it seems that, yes, the star by dyes can be used with beads. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, the next question is that you mentioned that no special buffers are needed with Starbright dyes. I have a panel working well that I need to stain in Brilliant Stain Buffer. I'd like to expand the panel by adding in a Starbright. Do I no longer need to use this buffer? Um, so if your panel only contains Starbright dyes uh, and other dyes that don't require a special buffer, you know, FITSE, PE, Alexa dyes, then you don't need to use a special buffer. You can use any buffer, any common staining buffer, your favorite buffer that you like to use. If you have uh, multiple dyes that, that require a special buffer, you should always use that special buffer. So um, that's the Brilliant Violet, Ultraviolet, Super Bright dyes. Um, they work best when you use that special buffer. And the Star Bright dyes will work equally, equally well in that special buffer. So um, you can, whatever your buffer you're using that is working, I will continue to use it. Uh, but just be aware that you can add a Starbright dye in there, and it should it should work well regardless of that buffer. Great. Will you be releasing any dyes excitable by any other lasers, such as the red or infrared lasers? Uh, so yes. So um, I mentioned today that we're going to launch the. Uh, 488 excitable and the uh, 561 excitable dies and we're hoping next year to release a series of 640 uh, nanometer red laser excitable dies. Uh, we haven't gone any further than, than the, the red laser at the moment um, but yes we should be releasing some red dies as well to uh, add to this range. So there will be over 30 of these dies in total uh, by this time next year. Where can I find the details of the spectral profiles for Starbright? 
So we have a dedicated spectral uh, page. Um, I think it will be biradantibodies.com forward slash spectral. And on there, we give a little bit of background on the Starbright dyes and how they're used in spectral flow. We have a spectral profile of um, the, all the Starbright dyes that we, we've uh, launched and, in fact, some of the ones we haven't yet launched. And we have the similarity scores with uh, competitor dyes that would emit at a similar wavelength and would not be compatible on a conventional cytometer. So you can actually see how different they are and uh, whether you think they'll be a useful addition to your panel. Thank you. I'd like to use a Starbright dye, but there are none available for my marker of interest. Will you be releasing more conjugated antibodies, or are you able to conjugate my antibody to a Starbright as a custom service? Uh, so, yes, we will release some more antibodies uh, next year. We decided to to launch initially with a, you know, a, a, a range of dyes that are readily uh, used in flow cytometry and immunophenotyping, and we're going to expand on that range. Uh, so I think we will we will pretty much double the number of antibodies we have uh, we will have available. Um, as for custom conjugations, it's something that we are considering, and we have a, a a form you can fill out on our website. And um, if you fill out there and request a Starbright conjugation, we will get back to you and, and ask you about your needs. Uh, and we are also looking to develop a conjugation kit. Um, so I think it's probably going to be sometime next year, but we will offer a conjugation kit and we will offer it for every single star bright, bright that we have launched as well. Right. Is there a difference between antibodies used for flow cytometry and ones for multiplex analysis? So I'm presuming here you're meaning in, um, a multiplexing flow experiment, so the answer will be no. Um, the antibodies that you use for any application should always be validated in that application. So if it's if if it's not in a if by multiplex analysis you mean another application, then uh, there are some differences. And a classic example here would be in Western blot, where the antibody is detecting um, a protein that has uh, been denatured is going to be different to an antibody that's detecting CD4 on a cell surface of a T cell, for example, that is in its natural conformation. So you should always make sure that you use an antibody that has been validated for the application you're interested in. If it's, can you use multiple antibodies in flow cytometry? Are they different from when you're using one antibody? Then the answer is no. Um, so I think that's about all we have time for today. Thank you for everyone for joining us for today's webinar. And we hope that you'll join us again for another webinar soon. Thanks again, uh, Mike, as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening.